on our trip. So we'll go to Africa, South America, and Asia. Uh, this project, it's a project we did uh, with a group of uh, lighting designers. We created this association uh, almost seven years ago. Seven years, yeah, seven years ago. Lighting designer without borders. Uh, the idea was um, to to make an association to do lighting design and to propose lighting design to countries or cities that were poor enough to afford any lighting designer or to afford any fee of lighting designer. So we, we work on a pro bono base. We work as voluntary. We don't get paid. And um, we have a, a policy that is that we accept project uh, only if there is no religious uh, involvement or dictator involvement. We need to have a local support uh, that has been expressed to do this kind of project. Uh, we work as a group. One of the uh, very important aspects of our policy is that there is no uh, specific design, that means we, we don't have any designers signing the project. The project is collective. Uh, for example, a group can make the lighting design, another group can realize the project on site, and uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the same designer from the very beginning to the end. So this is very important uh, to accept as a lighting designer. If you want to get into this kind of project, you have to accept that you won't be um, signing the project, and that will be a group signature. And it works very well because uh, I think it's, uh, it's good for getting back to humility and to, if you think you are the best designer of the world, sometimes it's good to, to you know, to, to dialogue with others and understand what are the others' uh, proposition. And also, it's very important to work with the local people because this is uh, the idea behind this association is working with local culture, developing local culture, helping uh, countries and specifically poor countries to develop lighting design and to develop their own way of lighting design. So we are really um, trying to, to help them to express this and um, to listen to them as much as possible. So we had the chance to work. Uh, the first project we did was in Bamako, uh, capital of Mali, that is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, we were contacted by a company of electricity of Mali. After we sent an email for, for the story, it started because uh, we, we just created the association and one of our members heard from internet that the government of Mali was doing uh, a renewal of the lighting of Bamako with the will of getting it more safer and more secure. So they wanted to put 2000 watt high pressure sodium projectors everywhere in the center. And uh, we were shocked and uh, we, we, we got some information through internet, an article from Mali, and um, we decided to write to them and to send this letter to the presidency of Mali. And, well, we, we achieved to get an answer from the company of electricity that said, uh, because in the letter we were saying this is a nonsense, we can understand that you don't have the knowledge, maybe you need some help, and as lighting designer without borders, we will be very pleased and to work for free for you and to, to give some educational program to your technician and to help them to develop image and nocturnal approach of Bamako. So they answer them and say, okay, we are very interested to get educational program because we never get any educational program. And uh, we, we invite you here, so we paid for the trip. And um, we were three of us going for the first trip. And at the end, 18 person members of uh, Lighting Design for Without Borders went to Mali. And uh, we succeed to realize some sites. But we, most of the, the work was dedicated to educational program and dedicated to, to education toward the technician, towards the municipality technician, and towards the people uh, working there. So that was very interesting because we, we really wanted to transmit our knowledge and our uh, uh, know-how 
it was very difficult because we had very, very tough condition. They had almost no computers. They had, we had to go back to pencil and papers. <laughs> and it was fun also. And this is a good thing about the association because you go back to minimum needed, you know. You don't have to, you know, sometimes you, you are with an environment of high technology, like we forgot about LEDs, we forgot about uh, sophisticated projectors, we forgot about dynamic lighting. It was not possible to do anything, no electronics, no, nothing, S simple things. We try to teach them how to express a project, we try to teach them how to analyze a site, how to make a diagnostic, how to express their ideas, their concept, how to develop the concept, how to make setup on site, how to try it. Well, we spend a lot of time there, you can see here this is uh, our uh, president, uh, Isabelle Corten. Uh, this is Marc Dumas, which is the uh, actual president of French Association of Lighting Designer. And uh, it was really, really interesting. We, the, the works last for a year and a half, more or less. From the very beginning, I was in the first trip, and um, from the very beginning to the end, it lasted a year and a half. And as I said, we went six times there, three person every time, and all together, 18 person. So that was very interesting, and it's why I wanted to show you that to you is uh, what part, as I said at the beginning, what part could you leave to the people that want to make their own design, to express their own culture, and what part can you bring to them or can you propose to them and how can you balance these two parts in order not to overwhelm them with a design approach or international approach or European approach or whatever you call it, French approach. And um, what part can express to show their own approach that is from Mali and from Africa or, or northern part of Africa from a country that speak French and uh, this is very different, different from countries on the east coast of Africa that speak English, the culture is totally different and also it's very interesting. So, uh, as you can see, they, they, they draw themselves, we, we decided to bring them as much material as possible, we, we brought Photoshop uh, software, we made uh, lesson of Photoshop for them and, and uh, we made a didactorial and, and we made a workshop on Photoshop. We brought also a huge trunk of books, uh, catalogs and books of lighting design and because they had no, no material at all. And they came twice in France into our studio and uh, we teach them, they stayed two, two, three days in our studio, we teach them how to do lighting design, how to do a lighting master plan. It was really, really interesting and uh, it was very, very fruitful and very enriching for both of us. Um, some of the projects, uh, we were very shy about colors. That was so funny because uh, <laughs> we thought that colors would not be accepted. And uh, this kind of project, for example, we, we, they said, well, why don't we make a project with color? And then we say, which kind of color? And then we propose color. And we say, no, it's not colored enough. You should really put something more pink or purple. And say, wow. <laughs> say, wow. <laughs> So this is very strange because in a way you, you don't know exactly how to act because really, well, for me it was my first time in Mali. I didn't know nothing about Mali, even if I am from North Africa, but North Africa has nothing to do with, uh, with um, Africa itself. And then, as you can see, sometimes you have some uh, ideas or, that are wrong and uh, very good to talk and dialogue and uh, express uh, the ideas of each one and how to, to construct things. And there was this park with uh, these beautiful statues of uh, animals and they said, let's do it pink. <laughs> wow. So we made the computer rendering pink and uh, they were very pleased with the pink colors. And uh, okay. but this was not realized, but we realized another project and uh, I will show it to you. So that we had uh, almost 10 sites. We did the light team master plan, the full light team master plan for the whole city. Uh, and then they asked us to, to zoom and to detail 10 sites with them. 
and uh, we, we achieved these 10 sites and uh, we realized uh, three, four of them only because we did, they didn't have much money. We, we had the opportunity to, to have some sponsorship, so we got some projectors and we all done. And uh, I, will, I will tell you two little stories about this project. For example, this is a gate, a very important gate to get into Bamako. Uh, we, at the beginning, we, we told them that it would be interesting to show the structure and the architecture because this is made with mud, uh, adobe, I don't know the name, mud, yeah, argile mud, <laughs> and clay, yeah, and, and it's a red clay, well, an okra clay, very, very intense uh, color. So we tried to get this uh, illusion of uh, the clay and it was not easy and uh, we proposed to make a very architectural lighting and they told us that this tree crocodile that was the most important thing the gate doesn't matter they said <laughs> the clay doesn't matter the gate doesn't matter the structure doesn't matter the architecture doesn't matter just the tree crocodile should be lit <laughs> because they are the symbol of the mako and they say you sure say, yeah yeah the clay shit don't don't light the clay and Okay, so these kind of things, really, you get into different cultural approach and um, you, ha you have to, to leave the project or at least to be able to share it and to not be too much uh, in, in an intention of um, making what you want, your desire of designer. You, and I think it's a very good teaching for a lighting designer because you have to leave everything you think it's true or good and then listen to the others. It's like a psychotherapy. You know? So we realized this project there. We're using the colors of uh, the nation of Mali, that's our yellow, uh, green and red orange. So they were, this is a monument of independence, so it was very important for them. And we make some try on site and uh, we use the addition of red and green to get the yellow and they were so surprised that you could get yellow adding green and red, they never thought it was possible, so we make a test on site. <laughs> and uh, we, we demonstrate that when you take a green projectors and a red projectors, you get yellow in between. So that was really a very, very good uh, things to show them. And it was not magic. And we realized then, this is a result, and people were so happy because it's a huge roundabout that is in the middle of Bamako and everyone is turning around as you can see with a motorcycle and cycle and a lot of people took pictures with their cell phone and they were so happy. They stopped, make a huge traffic jam and take pictures and because there was no lighting there. That was the first architectural lighting they ever saw in Bamako. So it was, Bamako is a two million city habitant. It's a huge, huge city. And, uh, well, it's a very, very interesting city and very interesting country. Mm -hmm. And then we had the chance in the first trip to go to Tombouctou. Fortunately, it was in, in 2008 because now it's impossible to go to Tombouctou because of the war. You might have heard about the war in uh, the northern part of Mali. And um, we, we went there with some projectors, with some um, white light, metal light. Uh, we brought the, the projectors with the help of a sponsor, Thorn Lighting. And uh, we wanted to make a test on one of the mosques. This mosque has been classified UNESCO heritage. This is one of the mosques that has some um, uh, problem during the war because they, they, they destroyed some gates that were 1,000 year old and uh, they, the Muslims de decided to destroy them because they thought these gates were not uh, respectful enough with the um, Muslim religion. But when we were there, we met uh, the local people. We, we, we proposed them to make a try on a mosque to see how light could react with the mosque and uh, they accepted. Tombouctou is a city of 45,000 people. Uh, the diagnostic was really easy. It was five projectors. <laughs> High pressure sodium, 400 watt. One in the main street. There was three mosques. There was one projector in front of each mosque and another one in front of the city hall. And that's it. No more light. So. It's total darkness in the middle of the Sahara Desert. It's totally dark, very interesting. So 
the idea was to find a way of expressing this very, very special material that it's called a banco. It's kind of uh, adobe, of clay, but as you can see, it's not the same color. It's made with, uh, I don't know the name in English, paille, la paille. Yeah, paille and mud. Yeah, paille? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, the, what what you think, well, what you find on the on the ground, and you cut it like that. Yeah, okay. So uh, they reconstruct every year. Everyone is participating because this this architecture are 700 years old, but they reconstruct them every year because it falls down after the little rains and and destroyed. So every year they take the mud from uh, the dry river and they bring the mud and they reconstruct. So we had to find a way of. Uh, of making, that was the existing lighting, so one of the projectors is there. <laughs> and it was very, very interesting. So, that was the projector from the other side, so that was the way they were lighting the mosque, and we were, wow, wow, this is some lighting, you know. <laughs> so, we proposed to use white light, as you can see, to, to get a little better rendering of, uh, of uh, the mud, of the gate, we had five projectors, in, so it was easy to, to construct a kind of a composition plan. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, we were very attracted by all these um, um, pieces of wood that, that are able to structure the mud, because the mud needs to be structured because it doesn't it's not easy to construct, so they put all this wood into it and then they put the mud and that, that helps the mud to, to fix and to stay. And as a lighting designer, we thought the, the wood was the best thing to light, to play with the shadows and uh, with the, um, the lighting coming from downstairs. And we were very pleased with the result. And when they arrived at night and looking at that, they say, why did you do that? And he said, well, this is very graphic and plastic. And, <laughs> and they said, we don't want to see the wood. <laughs> because it's just there to help us to maintain the mud. The, the important thing is the mud. <laughs> and we say, wow, wow, so that's going to be difficult. <laughs> so, well, we, we went in, in front of it to lower the shadows. Well, I, I won't tell the whole story, but you can imagine we make some try, we lower the shadows of the wood and we try to have the wood disappear. And, and I think it's interesting to talk about that because really you have to abandon your own ideas and your cultural approach because we were so, so pleased with our great idea of having these shadows all over the structure. and. Uh, and uh, well, they, they say, well, this is not the way we will see the things, and uh, you have really to, to deal with that and to, to abandon that. And to, it's like a question of paternity, you know, you, you have not to be the designer of the project, but just the translator of their own approach. And it was really interesting, and um, we make all the try. We were supposed to do the, the final realization, but it was not possible because, uh, well, there was a lot of problem already. There was already some hostage there that was taken by uh, the rebellion, and we could not stay there longer. We had to go, and so, well, it was quite complicated. Beautiful place, Tombuktu. But at least we learned a lot of things, and it was very, very interesting. And they are beautiful. These mosques are unique in the world, and they are very, very beautiful. So, uh, changing country and continent and culture, we had the chance to work in Sao Paulo with a Brazilian partner, Plinio Godoy. Uh, we had a, a studio there in Sao Paulo. We were asked to do a lighting master plan for the whole city of Sao Paulo, which is 12 million inhabitants. That was quite difficult. We were for a year there. Uh, they did most of the diagnostics, a Brazilian partner, and we, we did all the proposal. We finished the study. Unfortunately, we could not present to mayor because the mayor changed at the end of the study. And it was a, <laughs> a new mayor with a different party, so he didn't want to hear about the project, and uh, the project was into a trunk and no one ever see it again after that. So, but we work a year there. We learn a lot about this city. Well, I'm not going to explain the whole thing. 
has been a, a, a lot, a lot of, um, of development. The city has growth from uh, initial river to an amazing megalopolis that is 12 million inhabitants and with uh, the cities around the, the metropolis is uh, 24 million people living there. They have been uh, developing the city above the landscape, above the rivers. There is no more rivers can be seen unless the two main rivers. And uh, really, it's something difficult to understand the way in this megalopolis they, they really have a negative attitude towards the landscape, towards the environment, and um, everything is dedicated to cars and to infrastructure and to speedway and highways and nothing to pedestrian. There is uh, between 2,000 and 6,000 buildings, high towers, everyone is constructing new one. This is a city where the majority of uh, rich people go with helicopter. There is like more than 2,000 helicopters. People go from towers to towers. They never go to the ground, they skip on a high upper level. You can never see the landscape unless you go at 30 kilometers away from the city to see a little bit of the nature, so it's a very complicated situation. And, uh, well, some shock are very often, like modern city and very poor and low-income places. There is a lot of uh, places, favelas, this is favelas. I don't know if you say favelas in English. Slum, right, yeah, slum dog millionaire. <laughs> Slam. So you can find slam just in the middle of high upper class residential area. And uh, when they open the window, they look to the slam. And it's very strange because everything is totally mixed. And But still, we, we had to make proposal. We had to understand uh, how Brazilian use the space. Um, very often, they don't walk. They use cars. They are afraid of walking because of safety and security reasons. So everything is dedicated to the cars. We have high mass, 24 meters high, with high pressure sodium projectors, no pedestrian lighting, nothing dedicated to pedestrian. The inner center is all with high pressure sodium, and then you have district with very, very um, low lighting, vapor mercury lamps, and almost darkness everywhere. So there is really not any equity between the districts. So, well, to make it simple, we propose to focus on the landscape and to reveal what we call the ghost landscape. Uh, we wanted to have a better relationship between the people living in Sao Paulo and the former environment or the primitive environment. So we propose to dedicate lighting to the landscape, to the rivers, to the river banks, to places where it's not possible to see rivers anyway because they are underground and you cannot see them. We make a lot of study about this ghost river and uh, even in the inner center we, we found on maps wha where was the river before they were digged and, and put underground and we developed project to show or to symbolize river flow on pedestrian space. Um, we didn't have the chance to talk too much with people there because it was quite complicated uh, to, to make any concertation. We tried to talk with people in the street, and, but there was nothing organized, there was no association. The technician of the city did not want us to talk too much because this was a political issue and no one was supposed to know about the lighting master plan before the mayor discovered it. And it was very, very complicated, very complicated. And also, as you surely know, the World Cup Soccer Cup was coming up because this was in 2012, so we were preparing that already and they asked us if we could help them to propose things for the Soccer Cup and we thought that it was not really the good things to do because there were so many things to do. We proposed also to work on all uh, possibility of uh, crossing the huge infrastructure. This is all bridges, pedestrian bridges or pedestrian uh, footpaths and we, we wanted to dedicate the lighting to that and to help people to cross infrastructure and dedicate the lighting to people. Well, we have a lot of proposition dedicated to people, dedicated to pedestrian, dedicated to, to uh, another vision of the city instead of a megalopolis vision. We also propose to, to visualize and to beautify uh, the green infrastructure and to make some lighting into the parks that were totally dark sometimes or totally lighted with high pressure sodium high-power projectors. 
and we propose ambiences. We use masks that we used to, to use in Europe, like mm -hmm. columns. Uh, there was no, nothing into the catalogs mm -hmm. there, so we thought that we could bring some contemporary poles that we use in Europe because Sao Paulo is really a mix of cultural uh, European uh, things. We have uh, a lot of uh, people from Italy, people from, from Portugal, people from, from Spain, from Belgium. We have also a big, big population of Japanese. There is a Japanese district that is one of the biggest Japanese districts in the world. So it's, it's a mosaic, you know, it's not like a typical Brazilian city, it's really a mix. So for us, there was some opening to, to put things that were not totally dedicated to what could be a South American culture, but we tried to mix and to make a cocktail between European culture and South American culture. Uh, so we, we work a lot on the rendering and on the maps to try to express um, in a very specific way using, uh, this is a tropical area, so the green and, and the vegetation is very important. We wanted to show that into the maps and to have this uh, tropical atmosphere into the maps and we dedicated a lot of uh, work on, on the map rendering to have map that could really express the South American attitude. And we did a lot of rendering as well to express them. Most of the rendering were made by the Brazilian under our direction. Some of them were made by us. And at the end, we finished to propose what we call the, the lighting of the centralities of the diverse districts. Because Sao Paulo, as you can see here, is a huge, huge city and there is many, many districts. And we thought that we should try to, to symbolize the centralities or the, the most important places into the district. And again, we propose to dedicate lighting to people, um, having situations that are not existing at all. Like you have the existing lighting here with poles that are 12, 14 meters high with high pressure sodium. Nothing dedicated to ambience, and we propose to change totally to install benches and to make it much comfortable and friendly for people. And this is again another centralities where we, we propose this kind of thing. So unfortunately, nothing has been realized. We learn a lot about um, this, this megalopolis and South American megalopolis. Um, our next step in South America will be Colombia because there is a big event called uh, Encuentro Iberoamericano Delighting Design in Colombia, Medellin. 2014, it would be beginning of November. And we're gonna make a workshop with uh, 40 professional to uh, create the lighting master plan of Medellin, uh, that is a city of 2 million.5 uh, person living. And the idea again is totally dedicated to culture. We want to try to express with 40 professionals from South America and Central America what could be a South American lighting master plan. So hopefully um, next time we see each other, I will uh, tell you how things ended and uh, how in this lighting master plan with uh, South American we re could really find a, a different way of expressing light urbanism and how to express South American culture into light urbanism. That's going to be a very big challenge but it would be a very great adventure. So to finish with, I, I wanted to, to talk about our uh, partnership in China. So. Uh, some image of the Chinese situation, when you go to China, you have a lot, a lot of lighting everywhere. I don't know if you have been traveling there. There's lighting everywhere. They, they are using architectural lighting, laser beams, LEDs all over, millions, millions of products. And when you arrive in cities like that, they ask you if you can improve it. And meaning for them improving is to add something. So sometimes it's really difficult because uh, some of the city are so bright and so lighted that the only thing to do is just shut off everything and go back home, you know. But uh, sometimes it's really another way of dialoguing and discussing. And um, uh, even in Shanghai, they are thinking right now, this is the first time in China, they are thinking of making a competition to harmonize the landscape and the skyline of Shanghai because it has been such a mess and a chaos because every single tower is lighted differently with a different project. So they are overwhelmed with screen, LED screen that are like 80 meters high and 40 meters large and this is with advertising and pictures and 
So they reach a point where even then they are fed up of it and, uh, and they try to go to something different. So I think this is an opportunity to rebuild something, to reconstruct that. Really, when you, when you go to these cities and go at night, it's, wow, it's just light, 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 light. Well, they don't know the word light pollution, not yet. I'm sure we're going to discover this here, this world very quickly. And um, they have a lot of problem with energy consumption, so they will change. And, and Chinese learn a lot very quickly, and they will change. We had the chance to work on Chongqing, which is the biggest city of the world. It's 34 million people living there with more than 20,000 skyscrapers. It's, you cannot count it because you lost your life. You don't see natural light when you are in the middle down there on the ground. You, I stayed there seven days. I never saw the sky almost because with pollution and with uh, the skyscrapers that are 40 meters spaced, you cannot see the sky and you cannot see the sun. And uh, again, it was overlighted. And they asked us, could you improve it? <laughs> so <laughs> it was really difficult to be polite. And uh, well, really, it's. You see the image, everything is lighted, every single tower is lighted, and they ask you if you can improve it. Because in a way, they feel that something is not very aesthetic or very harmonious, or, and they really want to do something. And they light everything they can, like the way to go to the boats, and the boats themselves, and uh, the banks, and uh, <laughs> just because the LEDs are manufactured in China. So it doesn't cost nothing there. You can really buy LEDs for less than one euro. You can get a very good fixture. And uh, they put them everywhere and with um, uh, dynamic lighting and um, red, green, and, and, and blue. And well, you know. And they, they do this kind of thing. This is permanent. It was supposed to be for a special occasion. So this is like four kilometers of flights on the cliffs. This is just tremendous. And four kilometers of cliffs from here to there, there is four kilometers. And they, they hang that on the cliff and put them down, and, and you have lights, millions and millions and millions of little lights like that. And then they do the trees, because it's not enough, because you cannot see the trees. So they do the trees with these lightings as well. And uh, this is really, for a lighting designer, is or nightmare or dream if you are a manufacturer. <laughs> so we propose to be a little bit different. So this is one of the nice places in Shanxi. There is the only place in the whole city where there is still traditional buildings. They, they kept a little bit of traditional architecture. They, they put all this infrastructure in front of it. And they built them into the river because there was no enough place to build them on the ground. So this is the Yangtze Kian, one of the biggest river in China. This is the existing situation. And they asked us if we could improve it. <laughs> so it's what we proposed. We proposed to take rid of all the lighting behind of the towers. And they say, are you kidding? <laughs> and we say, no, we are not kidding. I think we, we try to convince them. Well, I, I can tell you the end of the story. We never worked there. <laughs> We, we propose many, many things. We, we show that to the mayor. But this time, it was not because of election, because there is no election in China. But maybe you have heard the story. The mayor of Chongqing was arrested for corruption. He's now in jail. And uh, so the mayor disappeared in the middle of the study. And uh, we could not work with him anymore. And so we had to quit the city and to quit the project. And, uh, but at least. We, we study things with the Chinese partner. This is in Sichuan. Chongqing is just near Sichuan province. And it was, again, very interesting. Uh, to finish with, I'll show you two projects we did in China and where we really shared the culture. This one was the first project we did there in Hangzhou. It's here. This is Beijing. China is really a huge country. Chongqing was here, more or less. And Sichuan is right there. And. Um, 
we, we made this, that was the first time we arrived in China. Uh, that was for me my first trip in China in 2008. Uh, I was invited by my Chinese partner that I met in um, PLDC in London, the first PLDC in London in October 2007. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to work on a Chinese project. And I said, why not? I've never been to China. So I arrived on January 2nd in China. And they told me that on uh, January 6th, we will meet the mayor to propose him a lighting master plan. And I said, are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> because it's a 10 kilometer long project. And they said, no, no, you have to propose something. I mean, we have four days, it's a lot. And I said, four days? <laughs> And I never went to China. I said, well, they say, how many people you need? And I said, I don't know. How many people could you give it to us? So they said, 30 people, 30 lighting designers will be OK. And I said, OK, <laughs> let's work with 30 lighting designers. So we worked for four days and four nights uh, with 30 lighting designers. And we tried to do something. And um, uh, we made a diagnostic, as we usually do, so to understand the existing situation. There was a lot of mess and chaotic image. Uh, some part of the landscape have been lighted um, by um, uh, Howard Branston. Uh, so some part were recent and some part never lighted. A lot of different lighting on bridges, um, whatever the structure or the material of the bridges. Many buildings, traditional buildings were lighted also. So this was a culture in Hangzhou. The mayor said, this is what I like. So I hope uh, you're going to please me. <laughs> Uh, and he said, my, my best cities in the world are Las Vegas and Dubai. Yeah. So I said, wow, wow, wow. So I said, well, maybe I'm not the right guy. <laughs> and he said, why? I said, well, I live in Paris and, uh, you know, Paris, uh, I did the Paris Lighting Master Plan and everything is white and we don't use colors and we don't use uh, screens, LED everywhere. And he said, no, Paris is not white. It's covered with colors. And I said, no, I can tell you. And he did not believe me. So he sent a group of uh, uh, his uh, technician in Paris. They arrived with 16 persons to verify and check if Paris was white or not. And they went on the Seine River and they said, yeah, every bridge is white and all the banks are white. <laughs> so they sent uh, them back and, uh, well, they convinced the governor to listen to them and maybe we could try different things and not making Las Vegas or... or. So we propose something like that. We say that could be a way of lighting it with some colors and some white gold colors. And that was the existing situation and we proposed that. So this was the mock-up we made on 400 meters long uh, site and uh, they accepted. But they said this is not Chinese enough. And we say, well, for sure, we have been here for a couple of months. We are not Chinese at all, even if we work with a lot of Chinese designer, but uh, we still need a little uh, time. We say, okay, you have two months. Say, oh. <laughs> this is very short. But still, we wanted to go ahead and realize this project. So we work with the designers. We try to understand each other. We, we, we show them how we used to work on contemporary and very modern poles and they, they try to express their own design and their own way of uh, making uh, graphics and design. They were very attached to the Chinese graphism and graphics and Chinese uh, vocabulary and we had a lot of problem and trouble with the colors like we wanted to use white light on the, on the houses and uh, I did not know, but white lanterns are symbol of death in China, and they put them when people are dead into the houses. And on the opposite, they say we should put red lantern because this is a symbol of richness and prosperity. And in France, red lantern, I don't know in Italy, but it's for houses of prostitutes. So we never put any red lantern in front of a house. And uh, well, they, they say, well, this is not the same culture. And they say, OK, let's, let's do it. We had the same problem with these poles we put into the water. We call it the Venetian mast to reference to Marco Polo that arrived in Hangzhou in the 14th century. And they say, we need to put a dragon, a water dragon on the mast. And I say, why should we take a water dragon on the mast? And they say, because this is a symbol of um, the flood, and we need to fulfill the expectation of the water dragon. If not, we get flooded. And <laughs> that was very strange for a European lighting designer. 
And I say, you sure you need to put a water dragon on a mast somewhere? I say, yeah, yeah. If not, people will be afraid of flood. So we did. They, they tried to design a water dragon. Here you can find a little water dragon. It's underwater, but it doesn't matter. No one said. But they know that there is a water dragon figure on the pole, and they are very satisfied with it. And uh, he protect them from the flood, so um, it's, it was very important. So these kind of things, it's very important. I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding at all. I mean, it is very important for them. So it has to be important for us, because this is, again, their story, their life, their lighting. And again, you have to abandon all your certitude and all what you believe and all you think. You want something very elegant and very contemporary and they don't care about that. They want something Chinese and traditional and so on. And, and at the end, this kind of project, it's, uh, it's, a, you know, it's like a making a baby with someone from another country. You know? It's not like uh, having a baby with someone from your own city. It's a project. You feel you are the father of the project, but in another way you feel it's not your project. And it's, it's nice. I learned that doing this kind of project. I, I don't, uh, I'm not attached as much as possible as I was at the beginning of my career. I can really make projects even if people take uh, the, the ownership on the project or, or the lead on the project. It doesn't matter for me. And uh, at least if the result is satisfying in terms of quality, of aesthetics, image, and even if it's not your own design, I really enjoy that. And uh, at least it pleases them. And they know their culture, they know what to do. We had to discuss with people with about the colors to be accepted by the, the people and neighbors around. We changed the colors, we, everything was LEDs, uh, dimmable, so we could really change the color. The only things, the tricks we, uh, I told them and teach them, it's to not use uh, red, uh, green, and blue, only green and blue, so no one could change the color because there was no red into the projectors, so they could go from green to blue or blue-green or cyan, but they could not get any yellow or purple or or whatever, and um, uh, they ask us why you did not put uh, RGB, and I said, well, I don't want you to, to change the color, so <laughs> at least you will be trapped. And uh, they made lanterns everywhere on new districts, because every single uh, house should have a lantern. We have, on, on the roof, there is a little single projector, one white LEDs on each tile, it's amazing, you have thousands and thousands of projectors. We had all together 55,000 fixtures on the project. It's a 10 kilometers long project. You have the existing situation and how it looks now. And really, we are very pleased with this project because we achieved it in 11 months. At the end of uh, February 2009, project was totally finished and uh, we made the opening and people were really happy with it because Hangzhou, it's a city where it's hot a very large part of the year, four or five months, you have uh, 35, 40 degrees uh, Celsius into the public space. And because uh, in China, the houses and apartments are very, very small and they live with three generations, like great father, fathers and kids. The, the public space is really the space to socialize and to meet people because you, you don't stay in your, in your apartment and people go out to dance and to sing and to talk and to play. And they live really out, outdoor and they enjoy the lighting and they really enjoy to, to stay there. And they do all kind of uh, nice things like Tai Chi and dance. And, this is very, I like this way of living. We don't do that, like in a square, in Mel Pignano. I'm not sure you're making dance in the middle of it. Maybe we should try. <laughs> and last project, and then uh, I will have the pleasure to debate with you. Uh, that was in Sichuan, so it's a very different state. Um, it's the middle of China. It's a UNESCO heritage classifier. Again, we had to, to propose a project to reconstruct the lighting that was uh, destroyed by an earthquake in 2008. It's a beautiful village and city. It's four million city around the historical center with beautiful buildings. That was the existing situation. Again, with very powerful projectors trying to, to show the rivers. 
And uh, there was a lot of brightness, a lot of glare. It was impossible to, to be in the streets or in the, the, the bars and restaurants without being totally overwhelmed by, by strong projectors and glare. And we proposed something more smooth. We use a jade color that uh, was one of the material of the Taoism, because this is a place where was born the Taoism in China, and uh, they are very attached to this symbol of uh, Taoism that are uh, mercurium, uh, gold, uh, and uh, jade material. So we made a master plan using the jade and gold um, uh, material and colors. And we proposed to lit only the banks and not the water. And uh, well, they accepted. It was again quite difficult to convince them to not light the water because they thought if we light the water, we will show really the river flow and the landscape, and we, we, we convince them that just the banks will be enough, and the water foam will diffuse and reflect all the lighting. We won't need to light it up. And we did it, and on five kilometers long, all with LEDs products and dimmable and pilot by computer system, and, um, and it worked quite well. I mean, we, we had the chance to, to realize this jade color combining a green, white, and, um, and uh, gold uh, LED was very difficult to find a color. We asked a Cray, the manufacturer of LEDs, for a special color. He said, uh, if we buy one million chips of LEDs, he will do it. So we said, wow, <laughs> one million, it's a lot. We won't be able to have one million products. So we had to, to build a new color by ourselves. And we use the, the property of the eye to saturate the colors. Uh, if, you, if you have a complementary color like the gold one and the jade one, your eyes will saturate the colors and you will find the jade, more jade, and the gold, more gold. And it works very well for the brain and for the vision. And well, we realized the full project in uh, two years. It was a little bit longer. We did also the pagodas, the temples. Uh, all the, the restaurants, all, all this is restaurants, it's to beers restaurant and shrimps restaurant and people go there. It's mostly dedicated to people and Chinese visitors, almost no foreigners goes there because no one knows so about this site. We design also the lanterns with the Chinese uh, designers. We work with the same partner. They, they were in charge of the design. This time we gave the design to them from the very beginning because we didn't want to design anything and any lanterns, any poles, and, and they made these beautiful uh, Chinese style but modern style lanterns. We lighted the bridges as well that are cover bridge. And again, people are very pleased to go there and uh, you, you should really go to China because it's a fantastic country. And that's it. Thank you. Grazie. So, good. To exchange, debate, and please, comments, remarks. In English? <laughs> good. In Italian, if you need, our translator will translate from Italian to English. So don't hesitate if you have any comments or remarks. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask you two questions. Sure. The first one is, uh, from your experience all these years, do you think that are capable with all the technologies that now came out to really uh, imagine the result of uh, of, the, of, of a possible scenario that you want. Or uh, always you should test it, you should change it, you should, uh, I don't know, sometimes at the end it's not the result that you want. And yes, th this kind of process is the first question. Yeah, the answer is yeah. I, I, and I am very pleased when the result is not what I wanted. I think this is one of the best thing in our profession. If you know from the very beginning the result, I mean, why should you do the project, you know? I, I like the adventure. For me, even when I started this profession, it's a human adventure. You have a client, you have sometimes an architect, a landscape architect, you have the people living there. 
So if you know everything, it's like you are trapped and prisoners of your own design. And I prefer to be as loose as possible and, and get all of the project, not getting the project loose, but getting the direction of the project, but at least to open your mind and your brain to whatever happened. You know, the result sometimes is much more beautiful than you expected, even if you are very experimented. You cannot imagine and know everything and the reaction of the stones, of the ground, of the vegetation, of the people. So for me, uh, tests on site are very important. I hate to have only computer rendering and, and uh, have the client with the computer rendering saying, on the right side, very propose that, and it's not there. And I say, who cares that it is not there? <laughs> so no, my answer is be as loose as possible. And with the experience, you can really be free and, and be open to others' proposition. Normally, when you are young and, and starting as a lighting designer, you want to master every single thing, you know, because you are afraid of uh, losing things. But uh, I think with the experience, just be loose and try to get the best out of it. And if everyone is pleased, if you are the only one pleased, I think it's wrong. <laughs> everyone should be pleased. So sometimes what brings people over people, professional or people living there, it's better for the project. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, the answer you expected, yes. but... No, no, no. Yes, but, okay, yes, the second question was uh, related with this. Yeah, and sure. So I think the answer is already, done, it's already there. But anyway, I mean, if there is a project that you made, you made it, and after you say, okay, fuck, I mean, sorry, yeah, it was, <laughs> it's very, it's very, it's not anything that I want. Even that somebody is pleased, I, I want to shut the, the, the lights off and that's it. If there is from a project that you did this or you, you change completely after the installation. Well, sometimes the project change because of maintenance. You, we all, all face that. We, you make a project and because it's lighting, you need maintenance. And sometime after maintenance, the project has not much to do with the original project. So you have to be used to that as well. Uh, really for me, since I started, uh, the, I would say I get the, the biggest pleasure doing the project and realizing the project, not going to see it after. I'm very pleased when I go back. Like Jujiang I went there last year. It was two years after, and I discovered the project again. And there was a little change in the color of the jade because, um, you know, maybe all the, the lifetime of LEDs is depending on the color. So because we had a green, a white, and a yellow, it was not uh, the same. But everything shifts. So I was the only one remembering the jade, original one. So I said, ah, oh, it's different. But no one noticed that. And for me, the pleasure of designing is inside the design, inside the first realization, or is inside the set. After, if the project changed, that's life. Everything is changing in the world. People, I'm changing, you're changing, fixtures are changing, maintenance are changing. So, again, I, I don't want to fight on this kind of fight. You know, I have much over fight to do for projects instead of having fight for, I would say, celebrate the result. And, uh, well, if I don't like it anymore, I don't show it to... I have projects I never show. <laughs> because I'm not proud of it. So we did a lot, a lot of projects since 26 years and many of them, I never show them because they are, I don't think they are good enough to be shown. But they are there and people use them. <laughs> Please. It's a very simple one. Huh? It's, just about, <laughs> it's just about method. You, you spoke about uh, uh, nocturnal urban densities, right? Uh, what? Uh, nocturnal urban yeah. densities. Um, how well, this is a term I, I use, but yeah, I, I yeah, don't yeah, know no, if I it's an so official one. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just interested in uh, understanding exactly how, how you can map from the top the city by night. I mean, how you do that? Um, just because I didn't understand the Okay, process. we first we analyze. Uh, what are the, the different areas, residential area, industrial area, um, area without any people, area with commerce or shops, area with greens, and then we transpose 
uh, where people are giving lights at certain time. Normally we do this map with different time of night when it's complex. When it's simple like in Jerusalem because everything is lit all night long, it's, we just put light, but it's a representation. There's nothing as a scientific result or... But if you take any satellite view, it's a representation as well. We all know that satellite view are not real. They are just transformed. So it helps us to develop uh, a reflection and to develop proposition like this uh, dark environment. So it's important to sh let the client understand what are the, the density or the, what is the name in, um, the baricentre, I don't know the name in English. Where, baricentre. Uh, baricentre, okay. <laughs> where, where are, uh, baricentre, where, where are the light important and where are darkness important? And these kind of maps are very helpful because it's, they are symbolic and people understand them very well and they can see what would be this representation. But we start from a big study of uh, all the material we get. I'm sure sometimes we're wrong, maybe some pieces are not littered and some houses are not littered, but more or less it's a good representation or good enough to, to discuss with clients. And, and it's important in a city because with, when you think of city, you think everything is lighted. It's not. If you really analyze it, you can find a lot of places because, uh, for example, there is a campus, a uh, university campus at 10 or 12 in the night. No one is there. It's totally black. Industrial area, you go there at 9 o'clock in the night. No one is there. S stadium at after midnight, no, no light. Commercial center, so many, many places are not lit all night long. And it's very important to understand it because your proposal should match or answer this balance. Whatever proposal you make, sometimes you use a darkness, sometimes you use a light area, but at least you need to match it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how do you convince people that It was very easy, as a matter of fact, because uh, we decided with them where to put the light. And uh, when there was no light, because there was no entrance, no door, nothing. So for people, they were very pleased with the installation, because there were their door and their light. And in between, no light, but they could see the other light at 70 meters, 100 meters, and they, are, they were really pleased. We did not have any trouble, really. We made any single implementation with the people living there. It was easy because there was very few people, <laughs> but uh, it was very easy. We had no complaint at all. And if they want something near the garage, we put something near the garage. The only thing we wanted to not add any light. We have 52 lighting points, luminous point. We ended with 52 luminous points. That was our challenge. We say we have 52 luminous points, we put them where you want. But we don't put other lamps. And they accept it. Two <laughs> um, question. Sure. Um, is Shanghai municipality going to do the the competition or it's just a... No, no, they, I've heard that they want to launch it. I don't know exactly when, but they want to launch a kind of flight master plan to harmonize the existing skyline of Shanghai. I'm not sure it's well defined into their... How many hundred lighting designers will it need? <laughs> I don't think it will be hundred. I think they want someone or, or some teams that can be able to analyze uh, it's dedicated to the river. Huh? It's not the whole city, the Wangpu River. But yeah, but the Wangpu River is already huge, and they want to treat 13 kilometers of the Wangpu River. That's already quite a lot of uh, a big part of the Wangpu River and both sides of the rivers because uh, this is uh, they have the, the civic center there and touristic center, historical center, and so on. And they have a lot of project on the river, so they think it's a mess and many, many parts are not lighted. So in their, I think in their thinking, they want to add some lighting in some part and to harmonize some others. 
and they want to launch that. I don't know when, and I know if which program, but uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And the second, the second question was related to Europe. Um, do you think that there will be, uh, there will still be place for designing lighting master plan in Europe or not? Um, I, I mean, uh, uh, not kind of energetic, not mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, relamping. Mm -hmm. Of course, I don't mind of that kind of master plan, but, you know. Yeah, well, I'm very there optimistic. Be, yeah, I'm be. very optimistic. First, because the lighting master plan has a lifetime very short. Uh, because of political reason, because of a uh, trend approach, because of uh, energy saving, uh, ecological issue. So we are redoing already some lighting master plan in some cities that have a lighting master plan 20 years ago. So they, they ask us to redoing with new approaches. So I am very optimistic because it's a, it's a living tool, you know. It's not because you make a lighting master plan. It's like a, a urban planning master plan. You don't make it for ages or for centuries. Uh, sometime every 10 years, you, you renew the urban planning master plan. So it's the same with lighting. I'm very optimistic about it. And many, many cities that don't have lighting master plan, now they understand very well the need of it. And sometimes it's for energy saving reason. Sometimes it's uh, for other issue like uh, nocturnal tourism or development of uh, night image or many, many different reasons. But there is a lot of uh, strategy that need to be launched. Very optimistic about it. <coughs> yeah. mm. Mm. They had one on the Thames. Yeah, but they made one on the Thames at one point. Mark Major did it. A little place on it. Yeah, little sign. <coughs> I have a question. Uh, what, <coughs> what do you think is the best way to dialogue with people? Sometimes said uh, like in the this darkness master plan that you decided together with, with people, or sometimes about listening and observing, or is the feedback you have after installing the the lighting system? I mean, you sometimes said that it's better when they don't understand because they let you do what you want. But yeah. Is, is, well, is what, what we try to do is to to go on site with them as much as possible. Sometimes it's difficult because it needs time from our side, from their side, but we try to, to walk, to, to go with buses, like we did the Latin Master Plan of Rennes. We had uh, six trips with buses and walking with, um, because there is 12 districts in Rennes. We divide it in six, two districts. And uh, we went for every single two districts with people, with bus, with pedestrian walk, with deputy mayor and technicians of the city. And it took us uh, quite a lot of time because it was six nights all together with uh, two, two and a half hours maximum, part of it with bus, part of it. And we tried to discuss with them and to dialogue with them. We, we made some questionnaires, inquiries. We gave it to them and then we get back these inquirers, we give them one month to answer and we get all the answers through the city and municipality and we analyze what was the answer. So more or less we got like 150 answers and it was a lot. And uh, well, the difficulty is the representation of the people because very often you get old people into this kind of uh, trip because they have time and they are retired and, uh, and the young ones, they don't want to care with uh, going out with uh, lighting designers. But um, if you can have a very good representation in terms of category, social categories, or ages, or generation, it's even better. And then, uh, it, when you make tests, very spontaneously people will come and talk with you and say, ah, I don't like that, I like that, and so you have to be open to that too. But that, I mean, you mean that test? To, yeah, to show that yeah, they, yeah if like, you make yeah. a test somewhere, like we, we made a test in Rennes uh, about uh, 10 lux uh, lighting, uh, street lighting, to, to develop it on a very big part of the city. So the mayor said, let's make a try. Uh, we have an avenue, we make 300 meters, and we deem it, and we go to 10 lux. 
And uh, we went to do that. And uh, while we were doing that, people were asking questions. And then uh, we were a lot of um, demands. And, and, and it's another way to do things. You know, and Very often when you make tests, like when we did in China, a lot of people were coming out and say, what are you doing? And why this color? And so on. So you can be spontaneous, or you can try to, you know, to, to make uh, it more formal with uh, questionnaires and, and inquiries. And yeah, my concern was because it's difficult for people to imagine how the place will look with the new lattice system. If you test, it's easier. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, but uh, at least you need to try. I mean, to try to share and to try to, to show them. And, uh, and it's so important to understand what they feel about uh, their own city or their own space. So the diagnostic part is very important because sometimes they know places that are well lighted or bad lighted and you don't know them even if you tour the city all nights, you will never discover these parts. And, and in Ren, for example, they came out with this idea of having more darkness into the city. We, we were afraid of proposing it because it's a big city, Ren, it's 400,000 people. It is not like Talmont, so we thought, wow, proposing darkness might be very difficult. And during the first um, promenades, people say, it's too much light in rain, we don't want that light anymore. Even in our parking, there is too much light. We should, could we shut off the lights? I say, wow, people ask for shut off the light, my God. And uh, we were surprised. So then we proposed, that was the first time we proposed a dark infrastructure methodology, and uh, they were so pleased with it because uh, they say, yeah, let's try, let's try. So it all depends. But in some other countries, like in Medellin, for example, I'm not sure darkness will be the issue, you know? Because the safety and security with the drugs problem. So um, I'm going to see if some people are aware of this dark situation or if they, everyone wants uh, safety and security. And, and sometimes politics are very um, demanding about uh, uh, safety and security and some people living there, some of them really want something different. So sometimes politics make demands that are not really related to the real demands from the citizens. So it's difficult to, to find uh, who is the, the best answer. All right. Ah, one more. <laughs> Okay, uh, what do you think about uh, in general the light festivals and all this temporary use of light uh, in the uh, in the year life of a citizen of anyway? And if you think that um, the light designer uh, should uh, think like an infrastructure, I mean that the light, the ordinary light, uh, uh, should use. Uh, like infrastructure, like, uh, you know, for safety, mm -hmm. for yes, this kind? Well, it's, it's two different questions. First one, uh, light festival, I, I think it's interesting if it's really a laboratory for lighting, urban lighting or architectural lighting or space lighting. Unfortunately, the trend is video mapping and slides, video projectors, slide projectors, and I don't think for us as lighting designer, even if I, I can like some of uh, this media video mapping on facades, but I don't think it helps to develop, to create, to imagine new way of lighting the spaces. So most of the light festival now are really that. And at the beginning, like Lyon was really a laboratory of urban lighting and it's not anymore. If you go there, you have all, all the projection facade and okay, it's nice maybe for the people, but for lighting designer has no interest. So I think if light festivals are a, a way of trying things, experiment things in, in a very short time and with crazy technologies or without uh, the need of being safe and, you know, and with the cables and everything, it would be very interesting. On uh, the second question, I, I don't agree with that. I think we should really develop creative atmosphere on a permanent basis and a daily basis. So people will have the pleasure to be in the night environment that is very fantastic and creative and nice. I don't think we should 
tell the people, okay, majority of the time you will have a safe and very basic lighting and on some occasion you will have a nice uh, light. It's like food, I mean, I like to have good food every time. <laughs> if you propose me rice and bad noodles every single night and saying Saturday night you will see you will have a very good meal, I say, no, come on. <laughs> so I think lighting is the same. We should educate people and especially kids to discover the pleasure to be into lighting. We work a lot now on uh, municipal equipment. We work on school, kindergarten, um, cultural centers, library like this one. We work on the, on the entrance, on the surrounding, on the facade, on sport uh, centers like um, swimming pool and just daily infrastructure that people use with their kids and with uh, the adults going there for a special occasion. And I think this is much interesting that lighting a church or lighting a, a castle or lighting whatever, you know, because people don't care about the church and they don't go at the church every single night, but they go to the kindergarten every single day and morning and evening and winter time. So we really try to create new strategy to dedicate lighting to daily environment. And people love it. Especially if you do a kindergarten with some beautiful lights for kids, you will see the kids, they act like uh, crazy, you know, they, are, they really appreciate the interesting lighting. And more interactive, the future will be for me that people could decide the colors, for example, or the tonality of light, because uh, why a designer will decide that it should be green or blue-green, or if they want some purple, um, someday, why not? I mean, then you need to put the red. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> because I'm vicious. <laughs> and I have contradiction, like everyone else, you know. In a way, I'd like to, to get the read of the color. In another way, I'd like that people... But the problem is, who decide? Because if we, in this case, very often, it's a mayor. And I don't want the mayor to decide that it should be red. But if it's the people living there that for one weekend they want it purple, that's fine for me. But I don't want that the mayor say, okay, I'm going to decide that this should be red. This is, no. But people, I totally agree. So. <laughs> <have a> okay. <laughs> what is a bad one? <laughs> Uh, speaking about different culture and different approach to countries, uh, I mean, the work you show from, you know, Europe to Asia, uh, I had the feeling, the impression that you put more effort in matching the culture of the countries that are European, South American and African, and, and in China also because of the time schedule. Mm -hmm. In a way, you are, it's not imposing, but it's more... You know, it's like more like, oh, I mean, I think we, Europe, we are yeah. a bit of colonizing uh, the Asia and China in terms of architecture and lighting and... I don't think so. No? Is it your impression? I think Chinese are really strong to colonize us. <laughs> no, no. Well, for me, the difference is in the partnership, because in China, our partner is really strong in terms of people and design and uh, they are learning very quickly and they, are, they can build their own proposal and all culture. I'm there just to help them and, and transmit what I know and my know-how, especially on big scale because they don't know how to deal with a big scale like the canal. They were totally lost because it was 10 kilometers long. And, and for me, the project in China are really Chinese. And, and even if it's my project, it's really, like, like I said, making a baby with a Chinese woman. You know, it's really a Chinese project. But on the other end, when you work in Africa, like we work in, in Ivory Coast right now, there is no one there to help you. I mean, they don't know a single thing about lighting. Even the technician of the city or manufacturer. So what are you going to do? You have to bring your own culture, your own know-how, your own ideas, your own design. Sometimes you're wrong, but at least you have to go ahead because they're expecting something. So you play on little things like colors, you know. They say, okay, we like these colors. Okay, you like it? I'll put it into the project. But it's, and same in South America. They don't have any culture about urban design and urban lighting design in South America. They are very good into interior lighting and museum lighting and architectural lighting. But it's why we're doing this workshop in Medellin, because in the whole South America, 
they never made any light team master plans. The one in Sao Paulo was the first one in South America. So they don't have this culture. They are very open to learn it and then to use it and to develop their own culture. But so far, they don't have it. So really, for me, the Sao Paulo Latin Master Plan is a European Latin Master Plan. It's, it's, we try to be a little bit Brazilian, but I, we did not succeed. It. And I hope in Medellin, we will try to get a Colombian Latin Master Plan. Hopefully. It's not easy because sometimes, especially with a workshop, you all know, how difficult is a workshop? You have to go ahead, you have to have a result at the end. So sometimes you push and you say, okay, guys, let's go and let's do something. So sometimes you take the lead, you know. And, but um, at least we will try to build a South American culture, or Colombian culture. So it really depends on what are the local forces. And in China, really, if you go there, you will see, even if they have international architect, they are never, never overwhelmed by the culture of the others. They are very proud of their culture and they don't want the culture of the others. So sometimes they need iconic image, but they are building a lot of fantastic Chinese architects. One of them has been the Prisker Prize and uh, is fantastic. And they are really, they are so strong, I, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I was thinking in this, in this meeting that we have to arrange in, in, in Colombia. Yeah. The, all of this uh, like we will talk on the rest of South America. Yeah, well, what they want is a dedicate priority to South America, Central America, and Spanish and Portuguese because it would be Spanish. Thinking. They have, they have this, uh, I don't know if you heard of it, they have this event every two years, it's called EILD, Encuentro Iberoamericano Delighting Designers. The first one was in Valparaiso, Chile, uh, Chile in 2010. The second one was in Querétaro, Mexico in 2012. And the next one is uh, Medellin, Colombia. And uh, they make two workshops. One is um, uh, directed by Ignacio Valerio from Politecnico de Madrid. This is going to be a workshop on architectural lighting, a very amazing space with uh, old railway uh, locomotive and so on. And the other workshop is the one I'm going to lead. It's uh, Latin Master Plan of Medellin. So they want mostly designers from South America, Central America, and if possible, Spain and Portugal, but they don't want, like I asked if Chinese designer could apply, and because I, I had two colleagues from China that wanted to say, no, we don't want to have uh, over, because they want to build their own culture and they want to do it first, maybe by themselves, it's their choice. So maybe later on they will open to all of their cultures, but so far it's their, their strategy. <laughs> I hope too. At, at least they try. I think it's a very, it's very courageous uh, approach. It doesn't have to be common. I mean, because at the beginning, it's like Europe. You know, Europe. What does that mean? Uh, if you look to Poland or to Spain, uh, what does it mean? I mean, there is no common identity. But at least. You need to start with something. So you're not going to start with Medellin, because Medellin, it's also a very special identity. It's not like Bogota, it's not like Cartagena, it's not like Cali, but you need to start with something. So what they're trying to start is to define a cultural South American culture. Uh, I don't know. I think it's courageous. <laughs> Why not? Maybe they will fail, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the tr the good thing about it is to start. What they don't want, if we can see it on the other way, they don't want American from ILD to decide for them what should be the lighting design, and they don't want European to say we are the good one and we know very well how to work, and we're going to show you how to work. <laughs> it, it will. You're welcome. <laughs> it's November, 6, 7, 8 of November, so...
you're very welcome to go to Medellin. And Medellin is a fantastic city that is really innovative in uh, urban planning and landscape planning. They are very innovative. Yeah. In terms of flight, in terms of urban space, in terms of uh, infrastructure. Oh yeah, if you go to internet and, and just Google Medellin, you will see tons, millions of articles about uh, strategy in Medellin, urban planning in Medellin, and so on. And lighting as well. <laughs> they, they have competition. They launch a lot of competition for urban planning, and they ask for lighting design into it. So this is quite innovative for a South American city. Like they, they are doing a huge uh, project on the river, what is called Rio Medellin, and this project is a 26 kilometers long project on the river, and uh, a, a, a team of architects won it, and the lighting will be a big part of it as well. And this is done by, so it's, it's, it's under study, on preliminary stage, and with the lighting master plan into the workshop, we're going to integrate these architects, and uh, we're going to try to make a wider approach and a larger approach of Medellin. Yeah, we'll, we'll start from the Zoom and we'll go wider. Because it's already started, so we have to take into account the project, you know. It's when you do a lighting master plan, there is never a zero start. You have project all over, especially with big cities, so you have to take advantage of everything that is already done because yeah, and try to, to give, uh, you know, topics that can fulfill all expectation and not having just the real lighting and yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And we, we try to, to teach them what is lighting master planning, you know, how from one site or one program, one use, you go to the wider city and from the wider strategy, you go back to the program of each single site. This is lighting master planning. It is. It's six days with 50 per persons, and we're going to work a lot. Yeah, well, students, are, they are professional. They are not students. Each of them will be professional. We have 30 professional lighting designers. Maybe they know nothing about uh, urban lighting, but they are professional lighting designers. And we have uh, 10 15, not 10, 15 persons from Medellin, architects, urban planners, landscape architects, and municipal uh, authorities. And then we are 10 with me to pilot all that because we need a lot of people to pilot it. So we will be 52, 53. And uh, they are all professional. I mean, they, they, they are there to learn, but they are already adults and professional. We don't have any students. I am the one that leads the workshop, so. <laughs> ah, in the reality, we will propose at the end, we'll show that to the mayor. It's a, he already agreed. Yeah, some, some from the mayor office is participating and assisting to the result. And at the end, the result will be shown to the mayor of Medellin. And hopefully, we will go on working on that on a very concrete aspect and realizing things, hopefully. Ah, oh, yeah, I've heard of it. Did you work also on a workshop? Yeah, it was because of the workshop. Ah, oh, okay. I did not know. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, well... <laughs> Okay, that's good. Yeah, uh, for me, the main challenge will be that uh, all these uh, South American lighting designers can really understand what in lighting master planning and then they can do it in their own country because we will have people from Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Peru, uh, Mexico, uh, Guatemala, uh, Ecuador, and Colombia for sure. And I, they all want to develop lighting master planning in South America and in their own cities. So they first need to learn it. 
and then to promote it. But uh, I'm very, very confident. Yeah, well, common sense, the idea is not to find a common sense. Really, it's to, to get them the opportunity to understand all this methodology and process, and, and maybe they will uh, act differently, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if you are from Chile, it's not Medellin at all. I mean, so you will have to apply to a Chilean city. It's not the same as a Colombian city. But I think this is really part of the cultural development that we all need because uh, if you just have a lighting designer coming from abroad, making a lighting master plan by himself in a week or in a month and then going back home, what cultural approach you have. I mean, you, you don't have time to understand anything of the city, anything of the needs, anything of the use. If you don't have a local support and really people that know the city, forget about it. But it's the same in France. When I go to Rennes, I work with people living in Rennes <laughs> because they know the city better than me. Yeah. And you win time. You win time. When you arrive to a city, it takes so much time to know the city by day, by night, that if you work with people living there, you win so much time because they know the city, especially if they spend 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. They can really give you a lot, a lot of very important information. So it's better to work with them. Thank you. Yeah, it's, and it's an exchange. It's good. Sure. With a glass of wine. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Grazie.